Hey friend, welcome to another episode of Rewild Ology, where we explore conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell-Norman, conservation biologist and world traveler. The more people I meet and talk to, the more I love seeing how we all combine our interests and talents to contribute to conservation. Today's guest is another perfect example of using a past career in the startup tech world to save wildlife today. In this episode, I'm chatting with Eric Schmidt, who is the Executive Director of Wildlife Protection Solutions. WPS's mission is to use technology to conserve endangered species and ecosystems, and boy, are they good at it. Eric and I chat about how WPS came to be, the technology they've deployed around the world, and he even shares a few stories about catching poachers in the act. We also talk in depth about the poaching industry and why it's not a straightforward issue. And as in most episodes, we discuss the personal struggles he's had to overcome and how he's continuing to move forward in this emotional field. Eric and I recorded this episode live in the beautiful Front Range right outside of Golden, Colorado, which you can watch on the Rewildology YouTube channel. We drank some tasty bourbon and had a blast recording this for you all. If you're liking the show so far, please subscribe and share with a friend. Sharing is the best way to help the show grow. And I'd love to connect on Instagram at Rewildology or email at hello at Rewildology.com. And now on to my conversation with Eric. Well, this is awesome. Yeah, (laughs) certainly better than the, what, 30 degree day with the foot and a half of snow when we first were planning this. Oh my gosh, I know. (laughs) Oh, no, this is, this is way better. That's so nice out here, right here in the foothills. Ah, awesome. Well, thanks for meeting with me, Eric. My pleasure, Brooke. Thank you for the invite. Heck yeah. Oh, we're going to have fun today. Awesome. We got our bourbon. Ready to go. Cheers, my good friend. Cheers. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. Nothing like some bullet. Um, Okay. So, kind of just to start out... um, Let's just start at the beginning. I was like looking at some of your bio stuff and and everything, and it seems like you have a pretty interesting winding path, which I think <laughs> is the most fascinating thing, like how people get to where they are. Yep. So take me back to square one. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Oh, you know, I'm a front range kid, born and raised here in Denver, Lakewood. Oh, really? Actually, I didn't uh, know that. Just west of here, and uh, you know, really growing up, I got. I fell in love with landscapes like this, going down into the gullies and running through the streams and, you know, the lakes and just uh, so much wildlife and, and wild lands were kind of in my backyard that ever since about sixth grade, that's kind of what I fell in love with and wanted to be, have part of my life. And, um, so, you know, going through high school and college, I always kind of had that in my mind and studied conservation biology at CU Boulder. And uh, as I had hit there, they had just begun a program that was uh, kind of an accelerated path Mm. that would allow you to get a combined bachelor's and master's degree in five years. And so I said, well, that seems pretty good. I was originally planning on studying marine biology or something and transferring down to University of uh, Texas A&M in Galveston, but I thought this program up the road where I can get a master's in five seemed like a cool deal. That's an amazing deal. (laughs) Someone took way longer than that. (laughs) So I did that and uh, through various programs, I got involved in um, a lot of local wildlife causes and conservation, working with uh, city of Boulder open space, county open space, national renewable energy labs, uh, all while I was still pursuing my master's and honors and all that stuff. Um, And then worked for the county for several years after that uh, and began applying around to different jobs um, and sort of said, boy, this is a this is a steep climb right now. I kind of need to shift paths because I have to pay bills Mm, and um, (laughs) technology had always been kind of a hobby of mine. So I sort of took a weird turn through the business world and ended up landing in a position with a a company out of Arvada here, just up the road, um, that sold Native American and nature-based things like books and CDs and DVDs into the national park systems 
and zoos and aquariums and that sort of thing. And it was kind of an interesting balance between, you know, my passion for wildlife, but it also incorporated aspects of uh, technology because uh, that little company realized that they could increase the sell through of the the educational products that they had in these uh, retail environments that are associated with nat national parks and things by creating essentially preview dashboards uh, that would allow people to come up and you know press the button for um, BBC Planet Earth and then you see the trailer of it or you come up and hit the button with the CD cover of the Native American flute music and you get to hear what it's like so you can make a kind of a better buying decision about you know what that content which is so great is all about but nobody's ever heard of it or seen of it a lot of the time because it just doesn't have that mainstream presence so they built that into uh, a company that really um, spun off from the media distribution house and became a interactive kiosk company essentially um, as that sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger, I was like employee 12 or something. Um, and it grew up to three or 400 wow. people. So you and were so part of the, I was, I was the kind, originals. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of along for the ride in, in sort of startup mode. And I got to do a lot of different things, um, ranging from implementation of their projects to, you know, helping with the, some of the sales efforts and uh, get to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on, like all the signage for American Airlines was like my project and uh, a bunch of others, Hershey's and uh, Deloitte and, you know, Kaiser Permanente. There's a long list of these things. So it got me, you know, even more deeply rooted in the technology world, but more importantly, uh, kind of the, the, one of the two, really both the founders of that company, I had become very good friends with. And we discovered a shared passion for wildlife and conservation. He came to his primary interest through traveling the world. And so about seven years ago, um, he basically said, hey, look, I would like to uh, step a little bit back from the, the business company. We've always talked about uh, doing something meaningful for wildlife. So if you're willing to step back as well with me, we can uh, found Wildlife Protection Solutions and focus what we really know about technology and practically applying it for uh, the good of conservation groups working on the ground for endangered species. And so that's really how WPS was born. And I like to think of it as the line becoming a circle. You know, I always wanted to be in conservation world and then kind of took a weird sidetrack through the business, but now I'm back in it. So that's awesome. <laughs> so what did you think or what did you do when, so the founder, so, okay, so I'm just going to try to piece it all together here. So the founders hired you, you were like employee number 12 and you ended up being very, very close with them. And then they came to you and were like, hey, let's go do something way more mission-based. Mm -hmm. So how, what was that like for you? Like, was, was there turmoil? I mean, I'm sure that this other position was way more stable. And so how, what was that like when they came to you and asked, you know, how did, how did you want to pursue that? Yeah. Well, to me, it was a bit of a homecoming because um, really when the, the business entity started out and I was like employee 12 or something like that. It was very much family and I knew everybody and I had, you know, very close relationships with all of the upper management. And you can imagine that gets harder to maintain as an organization just starts ballooning up like that. And so I hadn't really necessarily worked with uh, Dave uh, Widener, who is uh, kind of the co-founder of WPS with myself and uh, Sue Thompson um, in several years and I really kind of missed it. Uh, so I, it was an opportunity for me to re-engage with him, you know, uh, get back to what I love. And, and so, yeah, I was extremely interested in doing that and kind of getting off the, the treadmill of flying out to California for presentations one day and then New York for presentations two days later, and then back and forth, all this crazy bouncing around the country. I was like, Hey, we can get back to meaningful stuff that I think is going to benefit the planet. Um, and so I was, I was really proud to be able to do it and really excited. That's, oh my God. That's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, having, um, 
you know, my path as well has taken me on and off the conservation biology train, you know, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes not voluntarily. Yeah. And I don't know. I Sometimes there's just like, it feels like there's a hole missing, you know, when you're not that thing that you care about so much and you're not helping in any way anymore. So how long were you in that role previously before? Probably... Five years, something like that. It's hard to believe that it would. I've now done this longer than I've done that. <laughs> I guess it's the uh, it's the miles, not the age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're you're absolutely right, I, and I'm curious to learn more about kind of your story because I think that's one of the the things about choosing to go into the conservation space. It, it's a passion, but you also have to kind of pay the bills and that's a balancing act in a lot of ways. So, yeah, you're exactly right. It's, it's paying the bills. Um, and in my sense, quite literally. So, I mean, I don't know how much debt you graduated with when you, um, you know, graduated with your master's in conservation biology, but so I, you know, was going down that path of, I was going to be a zoological veterinarian because growing up where I grew up in the middle of freaking nowhere, the only thing that I was exposed to on how to protect wildlife was, you know, being a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was the path I was on. I was gung ho. I had that idea, like when I was 10 and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the only path for me. And then finding zoo veterinarians, I'm like, okay, that's what exactly what I'm going to do. Um, so I was on that path and then my senior year <laughs> and then my senior year at Ohio State is where I went. I just kind of had, I guess you could call it a come to Jesus moment. I don't know what else you want to call it, but kind of like that where I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. Like, I, I don't know. I had already applied to vet school. I was, um, I already did all the internships you were supposed to do, like all of your hours. I was a vet assistant, like all those things that you're supposed to do to go down to be a vet. And I just, I don't know, something came over me. I got my first zoo job Mm -hmm. and that was the first time that I could use my personality to inspire conservation. And I didn't know that that was a thing. Like I didn't know that you could use just who you are as a person to inspire people. Yeah. And so I started doing all the questioning. I'm like, I don't freaking know what I'm doing in life. What is this? <laughs> and I also got a job at the Columbus Blue Jackets, which was also personality based. And I'm like, oh, what is this? Like, why did I not know about any of this? And um, I was like getting so scared and so nervous because I was a senior. You know, I had this big path that I was supposed to go down. And I just up in a whim, just changed my mind. I it, The final moment is when I went into... Uh, my interview for vet school Mm -hmm. and I happened to be paired with the worst people that I could have possibly be paired with to be interviewed to become a vet Um, and I almost like ran out of the room like no I can't do this this is not the path I want to go down and so then I was like pretty lost on what to do and then um, shortly after that that's when I found my master's program which was the global field program that Miami University in Ohio has and it was the first time to travel. And that is when yeah. my love, because I didn't know about conservation travel either and its power, which I know that you are very, with what you do, you know, completely understand the power of conservation travel. Um, and so that's, that's the route that I decided to go down. And I started, all this time I was working for nonprofits. Um, and then I worked for my first for-profit job, which also show me the benefits of, you know, for profits with a good mission and how like, that's okay. You know, yep. cause I was so like against for profits, like they're the devil. Like, wow, I'm ignorant. That's not at all the case. It's all based on the mission and what they're doing with their profits. That's exactly. the only thing that matters for any business. Um, yeah. And then of course COVID happened and unfortunately I lost that job, um, last March, but you know, then, then this happened. And now I guess get to talk to people like you and, spread the message of conservation and share amazing stories from different viewpoints. And I mean, like if the whole point is, you know, rewilding the planet and that's going to take us together to do that. Yep. Um, and you know, wildlife protection solutions, like, you know, organizations like you that are taking a very particular way to do that. That's all part of the greater scheme and just bringing us all together 
to do that. So <laughs> I guess that's my story in like, I don't know how long that was, five minutes. But no, it's it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so on that note, so now I guess I just organically brought up conservation travel um, and just the world viewpoint. Um, let's go let's go back to the, you know, WPS's mission and what exactly it is you all do Mm -hmm. and where you're at and your, like your part of the whole greater mission and saving wildlife. Great question. You know, early on, we realized that there are a lot of groups out there doing incredible work on the ground, you know, support, supporting rangers, fielding people who are protecting wildlife and that sort of thing. But uh, one of the things that we felt was unique about our background was kind of that technology focus. And as we sort of became more inculcated into uh, the conservation realm, we found that oftentimes people in the field don't have time to be learning about the latest and greatest things that could be making their lives better or making uh, their efforts more effective and that sort of thing. And so we said, look, rather than come in and try and, you know, reinvent how to field rangers in in the bush or how to support groups uh, like that, let's put our own unique flavor on it and really practically apply conservation so that it can be meaningfully used by people who don't have time to be stuck in the mess of learning about it, deploying it, supporting it, all these different things. So I, I in some ways, view a lot of what we do as kind of the um, IT resource function Mm. in support of conservation. So uh, a great example of that is um, using different types of real-time data connectivity and uh, most often trap cameras that are communicating through cellular, but a bunch of different ways that parks can put um, these cameras all around in areas where they might be experiencing anything ranging from poaching pressure to illegal logging to human intrusion into core habitats and for and disturbing animals that, you know, need a space for nesting or all the myriad reasons that you need to know what's going on in a protected area. Uh, to be able to protect it well. Um, So we establish and we deploy those systems on behalf of those groups working in those protected areas. And that's one core function of what we do. Now, along the the way of that, we met several like-minded groups who were taking similar uh, approaches with other types of technology. Uh, There's a group out of Seattle called Vulcan, which was uh, Paul Allen's. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's uh, Paul Allen, kind of the number two guy within Microsoft, Mm. his sort of multi-billion dollar organization that he, uh, through again, conservation travel, got excited about Mm. wildlife. And he said, look, we want to do a similar thing, but, you know, mapping where are rangers and where are animals on the screen so that they can keep track of the rhinos that might be poached or the elephants or what have you. So we've partnered with them. We've partnered with other groups like um, there's a consortium that's built software called the Smart Partnership that has designed tools for rangers to uh, use in the field to track what they see and what they find and Mm -hmm. then geospatially map that in databases. Uh, and that can influence future patrols or park planning. And so we become experts in all of those three uh, core areas from camera deployment to Earth Ranger and SMART. Um, and we sort of bundle those and work with the protected groups that can get those out there. That's what we do on the field facing side. On the education and outreach side, um, as we were involved with cameras more and more, It came into our purview, this notion of uh, new technology by GoPro and others that they can deploy um, cameras that can film literally 360 degrees. And and then you can view those in VR headsets like you might be familiar with. And we said, look, this is interesting technology. To us, this represents a, a, a median point in getting people excited about conservation. In my view, um, a lot of the time, people like you and I, 
we become passionate as kids because of some experience that we had in the outdoors or things like that. For many people, that either isn't there or isn't widely available. And so the pathway that we see to getting people excited about wildlife starts out with, you know, you may watch a program in um, uh, about wildlife, you know, BBC, Planet Earth, something of that nature. You may go to the zoo you may, uh, you know, that may pique your interest. You might tune in podcasts like this one. Uh, but then there's kind of a big leap oftentimes to get people really, truly passionate. And that leap is oftentimes going to these places far away, spending a lot of money and seeing it for yourself, how special these animals are. And we said, look, maybe this 360 filming and camera footage can be an intermediary that is, um, exposes a wider audience to the amazing world of these animals mm. in a way that just TV can't. And so we also send people around the world to film rare and endangered species in 360. And we're currently working on an app that will let people put goggles on and really see what animals are like when there are no people around. Because all we do is we set the cameras out. We've developed clever ways of turning them into trap cameras that are motion triggered. And then we see what happens and you get some amazing things like the sound that rhinos make when chasing each other to, uh, you know, just the way that, uh, mother bears interact with their cubs when no one's around and it's completely unseen footage. And so we hope that will inspire more people to say, Hey, this is really special. It's worth protecting. I'm going to spend my energy and resources in doing that, or at least get them to say, Hey, I'm going to go out and actually look at this and go to these places and witness some of this so I can be more of a believer in the cause of wildlife. So really those are the two features, protection and also kind of awareness raising that we, we try and aim for. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so I want to make a connection here. Um, so I was just mentioned before we started recording Bill Given. So he was my first guest on this podcast and he just happens to be up the road. I might text him and be like, Bill, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> where, where, you, where are you at? Um, but so one of my big master's projects um, is I focus more on the people side, just like you said. Mm -hmm. And I built him. It was super rudimentary. I mean, you guys would laugh at this app, but I built an app um, that was designed to bring people into the safari experience and it became a citizen science project. So, cool. so whenever they were on safari, um, the guides, cause the guides are always recording their observations of all the, especially the cats. Like that was my big focus. That was uh, Bill's big focus is, is the cats. And, um, I studied what it was like to take these people, to elevate them from just observers to, you know, scientists where they're observing them from a scientific standpoint and, and the empathy that, that grew from that. And that is, I'm seeing parallels with exactly what you said. Um, and so I just have a, I guess this is just more of a general question. Is there any, like, as I'm assuming all of this information that's coming in is being saved into a database somewhere. Is there like a, a scientist or like a grad student that might be partnered with to, to analyze the data and like the um, wildlife that's coming in or anything? Or maybe that could be something that happened in the future or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really, there's kind of two data sets. One is the data stream that's coming in constantly from the cameras that we have out in the field. And there, I think, are now four or five hundred of them. Um, we haven't mm. done a lot on the research side with that resource currently other than uh, two things. One is we, we take a portion of those images that we have permission to use and we feed them back into our partners like Microsoft. They have the AI for Earth platform and they use that to iterate uh, and do a better job of having their AI look for things like threats or specific species and animals. Wow. And so that's just kind of a partnership we've organically made with them and they support uh, some of our work. Um, the other side of that, though, interestingly, on the citizen science side is we've kind of got a public facing volunteer portal where we have uh, people who um, self-identify, say, I'm interested in monitoring for poachers in these protected areas. The protected areas opt in as well um, because it's always sensitive information about security in a protected area. But they say, hey, we're happy to take advantage of the time shifting. You know, midnight here is the middle of the day in Colorado. 
we'd love for people to be, you know, scanning for intruders or vehicles where they may not be. And so um, as a volunteer, you can pop the app up on your phone and uh, scroll through and not only see an incredible amount of wildlife, but occasionally see a bad guy mm. hit the little button and say, report this. That then activates alerts to my staff, and we have worked out policies and um, procedures to get in touch with the wardens of each of these parks. And we say, hey, there's a bad guy, camera five, or maybe you should check on what's going on at camera eight or whatever. And we've had people here in the um, U.S. actually be the first responder to poaching incidents from around the world. And um, because of their eagle eye here, That's amazing. they've been able to make arrests and interventions and things around the world. So that's pretty cool. On the um, video side of things, we're basically amassing a gigantic, it's probably up to petabytes of data now. I don't even know of, what that means. Yeah. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> so you got what megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte is oh like. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's, it's big. <laughs> Hundreds, stacks of hard drives are sitting around <laughs> our places. Um, and we're, we're cataloging it. It's all kind of on storage. Uh, and right now, as I said, we're just building this app. Um, but it's not um, sort of been tapped for scientific or research purposes yet, but we'd love to, you know, make it available. Uh, it's frankly something that we want to make available to anyone with conservation mindset at no cost. So if there's anybody out there uh, who thinks they'd like to use some of this footage for education or outreach purposes, feel free to let us know and, you know, gratis free of charge. We just want to get it out there and see it making a positive impact. That's awesome. <laughs> I think that's a call to action to anybody listening right now. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> if you have any graduate research or anything else or just a love for that, yeah, because I mean, I'm having done something very similar because that's the part where like that project had to end just because my master's was over. But um, is you also have a long term study going on of the wildlife in the area, which is insanely exciting. So not only do you have the people side, you have the engagement side, you also have the wildlife side. Like that just is, I mean, to me, that sounds yeah. like I get super excited. Well, it, it's something that I think is a potential resource, even 360 filming in general is potentially available for researchers as a, a tool that I don't think has been tapped because of the nature of the, the technology, you can leave it out there. Um, if it's in sort of a flock or herd situation, it can capture everything going on around. You don't have to be there, but you also have a 100% playbackable, if that's even a word, um, it is now. Re repeat <laughs> repeatable thing that you can go look at and say, okay, well, I'm going to focus my, my visual gaze on this segment of the population right now. And I can literally catch every animal intraspecific, interspecific interaction that's going on. I can rewind it. I can repeat it. I can make sure I've got it all. Okay. Now I can just look over here and see what, what did this side of the herd do or that, you know, and see all the way around in a completely way that, you know, just sitting in the field, like when I was, you know, doing bird counts and things, it was like, okay, what did I hear? What did I see? What is it? And, and it's all, you know, in the timeline of life and you can never go back, but this way you can capture it all and go back and be really sure. Wow. Some amazing technology. This sounds amazing. <laughs> I did some game counts when I was in Namibia and I mean, I saw, I saw a brown hyena. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. You know, I saw some really cool stuff, but we had to get up at three, I think it was three or three 30 and we were just dropped in the bush Yep. <laughs> for an entire day until the sun went down to get picked back up, to be brought back. Which, I mean, I love that day. Which is part of the amazing thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I'm not complaining by any means, um, because it was so much fun. And me and my girl that was out, stuck out there have some hilarious stories of trying to be in the bush, knowing that there were leopards and rhinos, and we're just like, oh my God, okay. So, I mean, it was super fun and great memories, but from an efficiency standpoint, yep. and also just connectivity, just like you said, like, I mean, think of right now, I have so many friends that are PhD students or graduate students where their research has been completely wrecked mm -hmm. because oh, they yeah. can't go. Right. They can't physically go. Their research was in India. Like I'm thinking of my really good friend, Sarika. Um, you know, I mean, there were so many things that COVID just completely put a wreck in. But just like you said, the technology that you all are deploying, 
the opportunity is endless from a wildlife study point, from engagement point, from yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I'm very excited for in 2021 here is we're working to partner with several wildlife vets in South Africa and other places, and um, we've given them these same cameras and said, "Look, anytime you have a procedure out in the wild, in the field, whatever, f- please film it for us with as you know best you can do. We'll clean it up." But um, then we'll make this available back to you. You can incorporate it into your curriculum. We just had a vet in uh, South Africa who happened upon a rhino that was tusked by an elephant. And he, That's insane. No, it was it's terrible. And the footage he sent us back, I, I don't know how graphic you want to get here. Oh, but like, get, we're drinking bourbon. You can get as yeah. graphic as you want. <laughs> he, he, he put his hand in and through the rhino on its back, like up to here. And he's like, yeah, we can, and he's working with it. He's getting it fixed back up, but the whole thing he's filming and I'm going, my God, this is such a resource for other people who, you know, how often are you going to encounter that and know what to do? Well, now there's maybe even a resource where you can at least say, what did this guy do? (laughs) And it's like, you're right there watching him do it. So kind of cool. I mean, there's so many applications of that. I mean, because I was thinking, so one of my very first internships was at the wilds, which is this amazing 10,000 acre conservation out in Ohio. And it's so big that the wildlife is able to live wild. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was um, this, uh, you know, talking, those things are just, crazy out in Asia. Um, and she was super feisty, but she had a major gore wound on her side. Um, you know, you know, just common, you know, interest specific, just stuff. Um, and just thinking about applications like that. I mean, that that's in any scenario with a major gore wound like that. Oh, that just sounds, oh my God. That sounds so cool. I don't want to watch this now. I mean, I know this might be kind of gory, but this sounds so fascinating. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, we, we have the daily calls to review the inbound footage and we're like, oh man, that's in, that's more intense than we usually get. Because <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're going to see, right? When you turn on the Yeah, footage. well, so the filmers usually like, uh, you know, after they collect the cameras at night or things, because they don't see in the dark. That's one limitation mm, right now okay. of the tech. Um, which we've experimented with a little bit, but uh, they collect the cameras most nights, unless they're set up as trap cameras, and then we leave them. But they're off during the darkness because they don't just don't record. Um, but they'll go through and kind of say, "Oh, you know, an hour in, there's some cool footage here, cool footage there." So we're not just wasting hundreds of hours reviewing like, f- forward, <laughs> yeah, things that didn't happen. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's, it's always a surprise and, you know, just some amazing things that you see out there. So what are some of the craziest things that you all caught? Um, you know, one of my favorites is, do you know how a warthog goes into its hole? I've seen warthogs in holes, but no, yeah, no, <laughs> very few people do. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things they actually back in. <laughs> and when you hear that, it makes total sense, right? I mean, all the predators are out there, their tusks are up front. And so it makes a hundred percent sense for them to back down into the hole. But it's so funny how they just kind of <laughs> get down and scoot in with their little butts. It's very funny. <laughs> so that's a fun one. But then, you know, uh, oh, just uh, so many things I'm trying to think. Um, Have you had like any crazy poaching stories? So not with the 360 ones, the, my favorite poaching stories are the ones where we actually find them here first and make those interventions. Wow. I remember the first time that happened was, uh, during the middle of our work day, we happened to, you know, we have the screens back when we all, you know, worked in an office, we had the screens up on the wall and we'd kind of watch this and, um, we see late in the afternoon here, we're like, Oh, looks like a couple of guys in one particular area that we knew was, you know, having a lot of poaching pressure. And, um, we were like, well, that's not good. So we got a hold of the warden and we said, Hey, check out camera five or whatever it was. Uh, a few minutes later, actually, this is, this is really funny. They, it ended up that they, um, 
so those were the scouts, the first two. And then the guy with the rifle came through later on. Oh. And so we got him on the, on the camera as well. Uh, well, farther down the line, the scouts actually saw one of the cameras with the solar panel. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. So they started taking it apart. Oh. They didn't realize that it's sending pictures the whole time. And the guy set they, they the were taking a selfie. The, so the guy set the camera down. He really wanted the solar panel, which, you know, in the African bush, solar panel is a nice thing. But he's literally sending selfies of himself deconstructing our camera. On the the whole time we're like, yo, here here he's at camera five right now, like five minutes. Oh, another picture just came in. And so in the whole t other time we're watching the guys, the response team like creep up on them and uh, you know, we see them on the cameras following their trail. And, um, you know, the whole time we were just activating all the cameras, like more or less in real time, so we can get images of what's going on. That ended up, they got in a firefight. Um, no one was hurt or killed, fortunately. Uh, they ended up dropping all of their materials, all of their weapons. They fled. They didn't necessarily catch them on this one, but the three rhinos that were immediately in the area were saved. And we were just going, man, this is, this is really happening. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, one of those scenarios where it, the reason I love this is it for a lot of people here, you don't feel connected to what's going on with conservation around the world. And to me, this is a way that you can say, you know what, there are rhinos alive in another place because I was paying attention and to create that connection. And then in addition, you see all the cool wildlife just going about their daily lives in the in the camera feeds anyway so that's cool too and that's kind of the spiritual uplift you also get from monitoring the feeds yeah especially in the places that you haven't been before i mean i've been all over southern africa and just from country to country the wildlife can be drastically different because i think everybody has like the serengeti view of mm -hmm. africa which understandably i mean it's so well known and the wildlife there is incredible. Like I do not want to ever downplay the amazingness of the Serengeti, but Africa is a massive continent and the wildlife varies dramatically from just one watering hole to another. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that just seeing those live feeds and just seeing the difference sure. from one to another is amazing. And even getting into, you know, I'm very much enthused about other parts of the world. Like if relatively speaking, Africa, has got things dialed in with regard to their protection. Of course, they have problems everywhere as problems. But if you look at the number of endangered and critically endangered species, Africa, I think when I last looked, had maybe 16-ish critically endangered species, like large mammal species, not like mice and things like this. Yeah. I'm sure that list is much longer. But um, that same list for many Southeast Asian countries that list is in the, you know, above a hundred or in the hundreds. And so uh, we want to increasingly put more focus and spotlight on that. Um, and we're trying to constantly grow our network of cameras in Southeast Asia and find partners that we're trying to work with down there. Um, and then in 2021 here, we're starting to get new projects uh, online in uh, South and Central America and the Caribbean. I think we just, we were all excited internally because we got our first image of a taper <gasps> on no one of the way. cameras. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, oh my gosh, they're so cute. Yep. Oh. So how do you find your partners? How, I mean, in these far off destinations in these countries, I mean, like, you know, it's like, I know that this area could benefit heavily from this technology, Yeah. but how do you get there? Yeah. So internally, we kind of have a goal where uh, we want to proactively be trying to reach out to people who are working with animals that have um, a thousand individuals or less, because we feel that those are really... Uh, kind of the very much at the brink, right? And and they don't frequently get a ton of attention. Like um, when you, when you think or talk with most of the broader world about conservation, you're talking about elephants and rhinos and the charismatic megafauna. A lot of people don't understand the the numbers behind that. There are 350,000. African elephants, according to the great elephant census, at least non-forest elephants, um, nominally on, on paper, 
220,000 rhinos. That's actually probably closer to 10, maybe, white rhinos. Um, but when you compare those numbers to, boy, 1,000 less, or the the um, um, northern sport of lemur, I think, in Madagascar, there's like 75 individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, the world's most endangered primate, the um, black-crested hind gibbon, is down to like, I think, 50 uh, total for the population. Those are really the animals on the brink. So we want to try and support those. Uh, and so we kind of do some outreach every so often to try and find groups that are working with those and figure out how we can uh, support them through whatever means necessary. It may not be um, exclusively technology. If it's not our technology, we stay in our lane. We just say, look, do you need funds or whatever we can do? Uh, and so we'll try and be a granting organization to an oh, extent. Wow. Yeah. Um, on the flip side of that, because we're so active on the technology side, we are getting more and more partners coming to us and saying, hey, we've got this project. Uh, it's got this specification. Can you help us out? And so it's all been very organic for us, um, you know, between just sort of word of mouth getting around with what we're doing. Uh, and that kind of is almost on a little bit of an autopilot that we don't have to push or advertise much because of the model that we have of just helping people. Uh, and then those that we are actively seeking, we're you know trying to make overtures and it helps for us not to be coming in as uh, a competitive entity. You see, I don't know if you've encountered this in a lot of conversations with uh, field groups, but there can be sometimes some amount of suspicion or what are you doing? You know, why are you trying to come in to work with my species or in my area? And we come in and say, we're not here to compete. We're here to help. Here's technology. Here's what it might be able to help you to do. Let us know if you're interested. And that's been uh, a way to very easily open the doors to a lot of these uh, groups and field projects. That's Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that, which it's, a, it's so unfortunate. Mm hmm where it's like, no, this is my research. This yeah. is like my project. When in reality, we need all of us together, working together, if we want to save these animals. Right. But it's hard, though, too, because the, in my view, the, the economics around conservation are fundamentally broken. And so it's always a scrape and a scratch for the next research project or the next grant or the next whatever it is. Um, there's there's not a lot of groups that are saying we just need to do it for the good and support the people that are doing it for the good. Yeah. You know? So um, we try and be one of those groups that say no, we need to do it for the good. And uh, sometimes you you just say whatever. I I really don't care about the ego or the logo or the whatever it is. We just need to you know do what needs to be done here. <laughs> so. Yeah. And so is there, um, cause it sounds like, you know, the, the Microsoft example you gave, is there ways to get, you know, just these bigger businesses that might not be aware more involved in, in conservation? Have you found any like good ways for that to happen? That is a great question. Sadly, the answer is no. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I mean, organically, some of them are like Microsoft does have a great AI for earth, We've had some partnerships with Amazon that have been um, at a much smaller scale. But, you know, we've, as an organization, we've been in the fortunate position to focus on kind of field facing and um, impact driven focus. So I haven't necessarily had to do a lot of the more traditional things of fundraising and getting out there and that sort of thing. Um, and so we're just you know, it's a weakness in our organization that I don't have good insights into mm -hmm. that side yeah. of the world, at least right now. I'm, I'm sure if we focused on it, we could. I, I did sales for many years and uh, was just fine at it, but uh, rather be helping the animals at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can only do so. There's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> like I know you said that it, WPS has been around for seven years, but I'm sure that that feels like a blink of an eye. Yeah, surprisingly, it does. <laughs> <laughs> when you start from zero and build it to where it is today, I mean, especially since you've, like you've said, it, everything has been so organic. Yeah. Well, what do you say? What do they say? The days are long, but the years are short. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> I believe that. I believe that so much from experience. Absolutely. 
Oh, that's great. Um, so I kind of want to just go, let's take us a little bit bigger picture. Um, because I know that I used to have a very common misconception about poaching mm -hmm. and the motivation behind it. Mm. Um, you know, when you just see these amazing BBC documentaries or just something that you're like, how could anybody want to kill a lion? How can anybody want to kill a tiger or just this absolutely beautiful piece of piece of, that's not what I meant to say is absolutely amazing creature um, that you see on your screen. And it completely dehumanizes what the actual issue is. And so I'm sure that a lot of people listening might not have the same experience that we do when it comes to this. So I would really love if you just took some time to chat about why there's poaching and what's going on really when we're talking about these people and the kind of the circumstances that they're in. Yeah. Boy, how long you got? <laughs> I got all day. I got all day. No, it, you, want to, you want to talk about it? I mean, that's, that really is one of the fundamental, I think, questions and challenges that the conservation community is faced with it because it is so multifaceted. I mean, some people will say that poaching is an economic necessity driven by uh, global inequality, and I think they are correct in that. In that. Some people will say that uh, poaching is driven by uh, large criminal syndicates, and I think they're correct in that. I think it, you know, it's as with everything, shades of gray on a spectrum. We've, and, and then also how you define poaching. We've caught poachers who were literally going into protected areas and gathering uh, wo firewood and grass for their, uh, their livestock or to burn as cooking fuel or whatever. Is that poaching? I don't know. And in so many protected areas of the world, uh, parks are not seen the way that they are as, you know, you and I might agree what a park is. A park is a set aside apportionment of land that is there to not be developed, but is there for community benefit. And, you know, that sort of land use is totally legit and fine. And so it really just depends. Um, and, and that's where it gets really sticky and where we rely heavily on groups who are, you know, very much embedded in the communities and know the politics and layouts of what that looks like. But I can tell you this, um, I, I personally think that, um, like I said, poaching is, is gradients and we, you know, see people going into protected areas with dogs and they're doing bushmeat poaching and that's purely subsistence. But when you get to sort of poaching as we traditionally think of it, oftentimes like the going for the rhinos and the horn and things like that, I think it does get into criminal synd syndicates. I had an interesting conversation with a member of the uh, U.S. Embassy down in South Africa, mm. and they had said, look, you know, we we sort of have an understanding of the flow of rhino horn in sub-Saharan Africa, and we know the ports that it goes out of. We lose it kind of in the Indian Ocean, and we kind of see where it crops up in the Southeast Asian marketplaces. And what we can tell you with certainty is that the amount flowing out does not in any way get reflected in what is going on in the markets down there. Most of the markets are fake horn mm -hmm. and things like that. And so if you think about that as a uh, commodity perception and, and what is your play there, if you are a criminal syndicate, you're stockpiling the real deal. You're making a killing on grinding up cow horn or whatever it is that you're passing off as some sort of a cure to people. Your hope is the animal goes extinct, right? Then this suddenly is like, you can't get any more of this. You've got a massive stockpile and the price is through the roof. And that to me is scary as hell. <laughs> I was like, damn, that's alarming. And so, um, but then you get into the questions of the use of this whole thing. And most people... It's common to say, you know, traditional Chinese medicine and rhino horn is just like your fingernail and, and you know, chemically it is, but it's a spiritual practice and a spiritual belief. And you're, you're not going to address that by explaining science. So this, again, gets very much into that multifaceted aspect. And so it takes, 
you know, I think everybody working together to try and stuff the demand in the marketplaces. And, you know, I view that as what it took us 20, 30, 40 years to get people to see that smoking wasn't a great idea. And that actively like destroys you. Yeah. How long will it take us to get people to to convince convince you not to grind up rhino horn and eat it or carve ivory for a, you know, a decoration or whatever. I don't know, but you can work on that. You can work on interdiction in the middle of the supply chain. And where we really try and focus is the, um, at the front end, let's just keep the animals alive. <laughs> so. Yeah. So that's a long way of not answering your question, but <laughs> providing a lot of background and interesting tidbits. So. Yeah, no, and, and <laughs> I think, well, that just goes to show how complicated of an issue this is. It's not black and white. And I used to think it was, you know, when I was going through, you know, just growing up, you you think it is a black and white issue. Uh, It's like killing is bad. Okay. Well, who was that person that this might be their only source of income who, you know, like what if there's no other opportunity and they have a family to feed and sure. killing that rhino might be the difference between them raising their children or their children starving. Yeah. Like it's just, it's so easy to forget the human element and you know, like who are the bad people? Is it the, the bad person is the one that's shooting them or is the bad person the one that's buying it? Like who, who's the bad person here? Right. Um, and also, yeah, just education, knowledge, like all of those kinds of things. Yeah. So, but, but no, very much to your point, we did a calculation when we early started out and I don't know just based on the more recent rhino numbers that have been released. But, uh, if you look at just the South African, um, market of ecotourism for one year, I think we calculated it out to be something like. 15 no it published it was like 15 billion or something like that and if you did a one-time liquidation if you got if you went out and took the horn from every rhino and sold it on current current rates you might have 20 billion on a one-time shot and so that really gets back into how do you think about you know these uh frankly gifts that humanity has um and what's the best I hate to say use, but that is it. You can do a 20 billion one shot, or you can have 15 billion year after year after year after year in one place. <laughs> and so it's uh, it becomes a question of economics. It becomes a question of um, how do you extend that to uh, communities experiencing massive inequality? How do you do that uplift so that it becomes less interesting to go shoot that animal for quick gain as opposed to you know, let's let everybody share in the, in this, um, incredible natural heritage that we have, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. And like, that's why I, you know, I ended up going down the conservation travel route for that exact reason, because no matter how much we wish that the world ran on morals, it doesn't, it runs on money. It runs on what is valuable to us in a use sense. And if, that rhino is more useful dead, then it's going to die. But if it's more useful alive and well and prosperous, because you know that thousands of tourists that are willing to spend thousands of dollars to just see that one creature, and you're going to be the exact, the direct beneficiary of that, then it's going to be kept alive, yep. you know, and like there's, I'm sure there's several issues. I mean, there's several like examples here, you know, wolf tourism mm-hmm. in Yellowstone, you know, outside of Yellowstone where they're not getting much, you know, they're hated in a lot of other areas where sure. wolves are. Um, and I'm sure there's examples in like in South America, probably where you work in as well. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, that's one thing that, to my mind sets the South African model apart is in some ways they have been pretty innovative because they've actually privatized ownership of wildlife. Like you can go to an auction and, and we have done this ourselves with a small breeding herd of rhinos because we wanted to start getting more of them out in the world. Um, And you can buy rhinos or elephants or 
whatever you want and then bring it to your property and let them roam around and make babies and more babies. And then if you run out of room, you can take them to, you know, uh, either a private sale or back to an auction and that sort of thing. And really that's kind of saved the wildlife quote unquote industry in South Africa. It's, it's thriving compared to many other places you go to national parks that are, you know, massive, huge, and there's just not wildlife there. And, and it, it's because it's a tragedy of the commons since it's all government owned. It's, you know, if it's poached, it doesn't really matter. It was not somebody's thing to look after exactly. Or if it was, it was a department that is underfunded and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, again, that tragedy of the commons kicks in. It's, it's everybody's fault. So it's nobody's fault. So it doesn't really matter. Whereas, you know, in South Africa, that guy owns that animal. It had a definite price to it and he's out that price <laughs> or she. And, yeah. and that like hits the bottom line. You're like, shit. And so in, in the, a lot of those places, they pay incredible sums to keep the animals safe uh, where they can. So mm -hmm. it's interesting models just all around, you know, food for thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, because I honestly don't know near as much since you said that you're in South America. Is there is South there, Africa? Uh, are you in South America at all? Like any of the South American countries? No, we're hoping to open that up oh, in okay, 2021. Sorry. We've got some sorry, projects uh, coming online. We've got some in uh, the Caribbean and uh, some in Central America. Mm, okay. Um, hoping to get into South a South where, America. So. Where in Central America? Just curious. Um, we've got one in Costa Rica right now. There's okay. one in the island of. Um, it's a beautiful place called Union Island. That's part of Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. We've got another one coming online in Belize here soon. Wow! Oh, that's beautiful. Um, what is the main focus there? Like jaguars, or is there like turtles, or do you know what the main focus? Uh, actually, on the Belize one. Yeah. All yeah. right. So we're still early days. W uh, Wildlife Conservation Society is in mm. process of actually purchasing a large tract of land. Uh, I don't know much about it yet, but they were going to do the site surveys and start to tell us more about it uh, just when COVID hit. And then that all got like rocky. And so I just got an email from the gentleman uh, about a week and a half ago and saying, hey, good news. The fires and the and the coronavirus is dying down a little bit here so we can get back out to the field to actually take a look at this place. Oh so my gosh, I'm exciting. eager to learn more. So it's been almost a year. Yeah. Yep. Right. Wow. Yeah, it, the virus has just sidetracked so many field projects. I was actually going to ask you about that. Um, since you are so international and so much has had to stop when it comes to wildlife conservation, you know, just boots on the ground work. What have you seen? Have you seen an increase in, in any kind of interactions on your cameras or like what has COVID done to your work and the wildlife that you're Sworn, well, not sworn to protect, but kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. It's it's multiplicative in its effect. One is since nobody um, can get anywhere, it's actually driven a lot more interest in technology as a solution. And so we've been off the charts busy with people going, "Oh man, you know, we need more cameras out there. We need to do more with what we have, the resources that we have." So we've been busier than ever. Um, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, what we've actually seen on the broader global community of conservation is twofold. One is obviously tourism has absolutely just been crushed. And so that has gutted the budgets of tons of groups that we've worked with. And that's really scary. Um, that means there's less rangers in the field. That means they're less well resourced. Patrols are potentially fewer. Uh, everybody's trying to keep the wheels on and get through this thing. The other side of that is obviously the economics in a lot of these places that were teetery or brittle to begin with have collapsed. And that's created more pressure on these protected areas where people are going in and doing bushmeat poaching or trying to figure out ways to exploit natural resources in ways they hadn't before and potentially becoming more violent to do so. Um, there's a group in the Philippines who um, we had to we sent cameras down to because uh, a local 
quarry group started just illegally expanding into a protected area and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, now we're going to mine this. And uh, they had several of their people threatened, you know, with murder and things like that. And they were saying, look, we need to, you know, at least monitor what's going on. Can you help us any way we can? We sent them a bunch of cameras and uh, then they were able to document that and take it to the government entities and say, hey, this is going on. One of our guys on a motorbike almost got, you know, intentionally hit with a truck. Mm. Uh, so it's escalating because of the economic pressures people are facing and that's driven in large part by the virus so it's it's scary i'm hoping we can get through this <laughs> soon yeah so what do you see as like wps as part of of the solution you know while well, the friction solution so we're now that you've seen how kind of the world has gone and turned where do you all see yourself fitting in to helping this move forward? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we've done is we've taken what was otherwise our travel budget plus, and we've just shifted that straight into providing um, conservation grants to in, on the field groups and said, look, you know, what can we, what do you need? What can we do? Just keep, keep going, keep doing what you can. And, uh, we'll try and fund that. Uh, but then the other side is, um, technology, I believe never replaces anybody in the conservation space. Anyway, I I believe it's a force multiplier. Um, you know, if you hang a camera in a place, that doesn't mean that you don't have to have a, a, a ranger patrol it. It means that ranger can patrol some of the other 150 kilometers he's responsible for and, you know, maybe skip out that like little bit. So we hope that people can take some of the technology that we can offer and provide, uh, and, you know, hit some of the glaring holes that they know are problems, but then shift their attention to places that they suspect might be problems and that sort of thing. And and that way makes stronger, uh, protected areas and and methods of uh, conservation for the places that they're working in. Yeah. That's awesome. Isn't it just crazy how something, I don't know how something can just come in so quickly and just completely change our lives. (laughs) Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I mean, the whole question of coronavirus gets back into conservation as well. And how are we, interacting with wildlife and, um, how are, what is our use of it or exploitation of it or, and are we doing it intelligently? Uh, are we doing it very haphazard in a way that's cooking up lots of nasty viruses that eventually will bite us again? Um, you know, it would probably be far easier to sort out a, a better way means of feeding people so that we didn't have to you know, gather all this crazy wildlife that would never encounter each other in these markets, you know, that are just laboratories for zoonotic disease. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, literally the wet markets are how many things have come out of the wet markets. Right. That's just, yeah. Let's be real. (laughs) And, and, And if you weigh the global cost of this from a pure economic side, how much would it be cheaper to actually just figure out how to feed people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I guess, um, I guess on that note, I think we're, we're going on the right path. From your, just from your personal standpoint, what is, what's the hardest part for you? Like, what is the biggest struggle being in this field and what you do? To me, it's always been, uh, this is going to sound really grim, but it's always like having hope. You know, like I, I don't, I don't see us winning a lot. Us being the conservation side. (laughs) I I think that you can absolutely point to incredible stories and those are good and fantastic. And I want to encourage more of those, but uh, we need, we need more people to pay more attention. And I'd like to think that maybe with some of the big changes happening in the world, like increased automation and uh, things like, uh, you know, larger availability of people looking to do f- meaningful things with their lives and their time and things like that. We can put more emphasis on preservation of nature. Um, but right now, you know, humanity's not in that mode, I think. And that concerns me. So that's a challenge. I, I think. <laughs> yeah. And where do you see kind of your daily work? 
helping with that? You know, I think that it's um, twofold, really. One is we can, you can use kind of the technology to reach out to the people who may not be uh, nature minded, if you will. And it can be kind of a bridge, kind of like I was talking about with the 360 and that sort of thing. Uh, you can use the technology to kind of stay connected and, you know, make a difference in the conservation through the apps like like we've developed. Um, but ultimately, I, I think it's getting more people excited, meeting them where they are about the the global wildlife situation. And so how do we expand that overall audience? Um, and that's kind of where the education outreach side comes in for us. Nice. If anybody wants to volunteer, how do they volunteer with you? Yeah, just shoot an email to info at wildlifeprotectionsolutions.org. Um, and we're always happy to have people either monitor the app or, um, you know, get involved in, frankly, any way that uh, that might make sense. We've um, had people come with us to deploy cameras in the field. We've had c people come with us to, uh, you know, help with things like the video, 360 filming, um, always looking for people who are doing education and outreach. And um, part of our model for that is uh, if, if you have an organization, or you're working with someone and you think that uh, 360 might um, positively impact your organization. We're happy to come out and film whatever it is you do and make all of that available to you. Uh, we had one great story from uh, a, wild, a veterinary wildlife program in Texas Christian University, and um, they filmed some of the veterinary procedures, like I was mentioning earlier, and um, they gave one of the goggles to one of their, I guess, mid-level donors who'd supported them for some time, but not you know, in great splashes. Uh, but he kind of saw what we had put together after our, uh, trip together and, um, then cut a f five figure check, uh, <laughs> Okay. you know, a, a, a mid five figure check, which was like a 10 X increase of what I had ever done before. And so we love that model. Uh, we love to try and figure out how to get more more people and more dollars coming in supporting the partner groups that we work with. So um, always consider the door open there. Awesome. What asks or advice do you have for anyone listening? Yeah. Um, great question. I, I Obviously I would say, you know, probably with your audience, they're already fairly involved as they can be. Um, I would say keep keep up what you're doing. If you're passionate about wildlife, figure out how to do more. Um, and, you know, I would suggest that uh, if I could give one message to the conservation community, please be as collaborative as possible. Um, the more we row the boat together, uh, the better that is for everyone. And that's kind of been a theme that I've tried to inculcate into our uh, corporate culture and I think that I see more of it starting to happen with more groups that we're interacting with. So I'm pretty, pretty hopeful about that, actually. That's beautiful. One of my last guests, that's pretty much exactly what he said is um, we're building a wolf pack and we're all louder when we howl together. It's a great and I analogy. Was like, I love that. That was, I mean, that's all the episode ended. I'm like, that is the most beautiful thing I think <laughs> I've ever heard. Yeah, we howl louder, you know, when we're when we all howl together, we're way louder. And nice. I, I just thought that that was beautiful. And like that's that's what this is all about. You know, how can we together as a community rewild the planet? How can we make it better? Let's start yeah. with all of our efforts combined, <laughs> like and coming from so many different angles of how we're coming together to to hopefully help be part of the solution whatever that solution is. I know. And you come from the technology side, which is great. I don't know anything about that, which I love. That's why I love you know, like coming here. Like you allow me to come here and chat with you and, and what that means and what that represents. And because like right now I work for a startup and, um, and they're doing something very similar, you know, it's just trying to be that disruptor by using technology and then building something from scratch. And, um, I think it's so honorable and, and just, it's, it's like, 
it's like the 21st century way of doing conservation. Yeah. In other words, it's kind of the way that I view what you're doing. It's like, okay, I'm a, I'm taking what is very relevant now, you know, that so many other, you know, Google and all these other big businesses are their technology they're doing and like we're, we're applying it for good. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I think it's super inspiring. Awesome. And if anybody wants to get a hold of you or WPS, is that email the best way to go? Or actually, my personal email, I'll give you the short one. It's uh, Eric, E R I C, at WPS Watch, W A T C H dot org. Nice. That way you don't have to type wildlife protection solutions dot org, <laughs> which is giant. But you can also check out our webpage, wildlife protection solutions dot org. Awesome. Thank you for coming on. My pleasure, Brooke. Thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.